All right, everybody, let's go ahead and start. It's 10.30. Let's kick this off. Welcome to, to Shark Fest. So this is the intro hour and 15 minutes I'm going to use just to talk about getting started with, with Wireshark, making sense of the matrix. Uh, I'm going to show you a few tips and tricks that I use and have just learned over the years to be able to make better sense of a trace file after we capture it. Now, the reason why I use the word matrix for the title is that we've, I'm sure we've all seen the movie. And when you look at that green code going down the screen, the whole pur purpose of that code initially in that movie was that it was difficult to understand. He's looking at a bunch of code and he doesn't really understand what that code means. That's how Wireshark can seem, can it? You can grab a big, huge trace file and you see a bunch of packets, but what does it mean? How do I interpret it? See, really, that's the key. That's where we want to get with Wireshark. So the whole purpose of this class or this uh, intro session was just to get more comfortable setting us up so that all the other sessions, when they start to add more filters and more tips and tricks on top of this, that we can keep up. So last year, if you were here, wait, is this anyone's first Shark Fest? Awesome. Great. Welcome. Good to have you. So uh, last year we did an eight hour, like a full day version of this presentation. And it was fun. We got into it. We had a lot of labs. We had a lot of hands on with it. But this year they asked, you know what, can we just cram it down to one session and just do it in an hour and 15 minutes? So I'm going to try to do that. Uh, but I'm going to assume that everyone in here is a new Wireshark user. Uh, you're a newbie to it. And that's okay. It's good that you're here, and I'm glad that you're in this room. There's absolutely nothing wrong with newbies. In fact, I love teaching the new uh, classes. I love teaching intro classes. The reason why is because for me, as an instructor, what I end up doing is I go over and over and over the fundamentals. You're just continually talking about the simple things. And you know what? When it comes down to an actual trace file that we're troubleshooting, you know how often the root cause comes down to something simple? A lot of the time. But when we're into the deep stuff and we're into the hex values and all these really deep things, a lot of times that's when we miss the problem. Because we overcomplicate it. We're looking above into the application and looking at all these codes and we know what? It was just something simple. Maybe it was just an ICMP packet that was telling us what the problem was. But we overlooked it because we tried to overcomplicate it. So that's why I love teaching in the intro classes. Because for me, as an instructor, again, I keep going over the fundamentals. And sometimes I might be, I'm actually working on a, a customer trace file right now, and sometimes teaching in an intro class will help me go back and find the problem because I overcomplicated it, right? So good, so it's great to have you here. Welcome. And let's go ahead and kick this off. Just to introduce myself, so my name is Chris Greer, work for a company called Packet Pioneer, basically do consulting and professional services. So in addition to do my own private practice of reading and analyzing trace files, uh, I also work for a few industry vendors that, that create devices, uh, tools that uh, people uh, will use to troubleshoot. Uh, however, I keep coming back to Wireshark. It's absolutely one of my favorite tools, and uh, it's, it's something that I, I enjoy using. Uh, I, when I'm not teaching a class like this or out there consulting or teaching, you'll also find me on lovemytool.com. This is one of the sponsors for SharkFest. Uh, so I'll, I'll be a contributor. You might see me on a video out there or just sharing some of the war stories that we run into. So if you haven't ever been out to lovemytool.com, definitely invite you to go out there. It's a nice little repository of technical information. Also, uh, I do some bright talk sessions from time to time. I also have a YouTube channel with some stuff. Uh, a lot of last year's videos from Sharkfest are out there on my YouTube channel. So if you want to catch up on what you missed last year, catch up on all the fun, definitely invite you to head out there. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. So I don't, I haven't yet downloaded the wireless. So I don't know how good it is here. If you have access, you can download this. But the trace files I'm going to be showing and using you, using in this uh, uh, class, you can find them at bit.ly slash packet analysis. And I'll download a small file, and there's a couple of trace files that have been uh, sanitized and scrubbed, and you can use them for training purposes. 
So uh, I invite you to follow along if you'd like to. If not, no problem. This is being recorded. You can uh, follow along later. That's not a problem either. If you have any questions along the way, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Ask me. I don't mind stopping and, and addressing those questions. Uh, or if you're a little shy about it, you can come up afterward, and we can definitely review something with you if you'd like to do that as well. That's a little housekeeping. But before we talk about some of the, you know, get into the traces, get into the protocols, let's talk about why packets. Why do we use packets to troubleshoot things? Uh, why is this still a hot topic? Why is it still relevant to what we're doing today? You know, it's interesting. You might go to an industry trade show, Interop, or one of those trade shows with a bunch of different pretty screens and charts and graphs everywhere. Uh, and there's a lot of tools that are helping us to do network analysis today. However, a lot of those tools require the fundamental understanding of doing packet analysis to be able to use those tools. In fact, a couple of the classes that I teach for vendors, they have pro products that use packets to create these pretty charts and graphs. But to interpret those charts and graphs, to actually show us what the root cause is or what's the underlying problem that we're going after, it requires an understanding of packets. So we haven't left where we're at today. This is, it's a fantastic, detailed data set that really gives us the truth of what's going on in the wire. That's why you hear a lot of the pre presenters here say packets don't lie. I'm sure you've all found that to be the case as you've gotten into wire the difficulty is figuring out what truth are they telling. They tell us what's happening on the wire. That's the fact. No one can fight with you. This is really what's happening in the, at the traffic level. However, interpreting those packets is the trick. That's the art. Also, we can't fix what we can't see. So how many times have you found yourself as a network engineer? By the way, how many of us are from a networking background versus server? Networking side? Okay, now would be security. How about server application virtual environment? Okay, cool. I like to ask that question because, or, or both sometimes, uh, because a lot of times we, we find ourselves in a finger pointing situation today, right? Uh, especially as network engineers, we hear the network slow all the time. In fact, if you don't hear that, then let me know what your secret is. <laughs> Actually, I like hearing that because then I have a job. But the network's slow. People point at the network even if they don't have any idea what the issue is. In fact, not long ago, I, I just had a credit card issue. One of my credit cards was having like a, an issue. I had to call in and say, hey, what's going on with this? And the person on the phone that was sitting in a call center, who knows where in the world, they told me, uh, we're having a, a networking problem today. The network is slow. Can you just hang on a second while it's, it's taking a long time today? So how's the weather where you're at? <laughs> this person said the network is slow. Did, did they have any idea what the root cause was? Can they absolutely blame the network empirically? Of course not. So it's a culture thing, right, where we start to point the fingers in different directions. Now, for from the networking side of the house, a lot of times we're defending ourselves, right? It's, it's not the network, and this is why. And I can prove. I've got this big fat pipe, there's you know, this much throughput, I don't have any packet loss, routing looks good, so it can't be my network. So we should throw the ball over to whatever silo we're trying to work with. Now, for a long time, that was enough. We could say it's not the network, and this is why. Because this is, look at all these tools, look at all this green we have up here, there's nothing down. Things are looking good, got all this green on my little uh, LCD monitor in my data center, things look fine. So it's not me. Now for a long time that, that was fine, that was enough. In the 90s, 2000, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9. But guess what, we're here now in a period of time in our jobs where we now have to do more than just not blame the network. Or exonerate our domain. See now, as network engineers, we now have to embrace the fact that we own the highways and byways where this traffic is flowing. We can capture it, we can divert it, we can send it to analyzers to collect it, right? We, we own the highways. The server application people don't. They're just hoping that their stuff gets there. 
But we own these highways and byways, so now we have access to the packets. We have more tools than ever available to us for interpreting what that traffic is doing. But that's also why now we have to embrace the fact that as network engineers, we've got to take our, our uh, skill set up a level, or two, or seven. We need to be able to say, this is not, it's not the network. This is why I know it's not the network. However, due to the packets and what's really happening, this is what it is. Or this is the area. This is why I can say, it's your server, Mr. Server Person. And I can prove it because I, I see 45 second response times coming for you. See, that's a powerful data set that we have available to us. All we got to do is capture it and be able to interpret it. But that's why we're at where we're, we are where we're at today. We need to be able to capture and to interpret what's going on on the wire. Now, packet analysis is the most detailed uh, troubleshooting method that we have. I'm sure on your systems you use, uh, use NetFlow, you use SNMP, you use a lot of different types of tools that give you analytics about the network. However, packets are the most detailed, and they're going to show us the truth of what's happening at all seven layers. However, co collecting that, then, is the first thing that we have to do properly. Right? So if we can't capture something, we can't interpret it. In a switched environment, we need to be able to collect the problem. If I just walk up to a switch and snap in an analyzer, i got my Wireshark here and I have a client server, let's just imagine they're on the same switch. If I walk up with a, a laptop and snap in and hit capture with Wireshark, am I going to see those two guys talking to each other? No. Why not? But why not? It's a switch. It's doing what we ask it to. It's switching that conversation between those two devices. It's working. However, I can't just go up and snap in and hit capture. I need to be able to direct that traffic in some way to my analyzer. Now, there's three major ways to do that. There's three common uh, capture methods that we use today. All right, so the first one, span mirror. I'd like to talk about this for a moment just because uh, sometimes we make assumptions about span mirrors. So first of all, fundamentally, a span mirror Depending on the vendor that we're using, uh, that will determine what, what we name it. It could be monitor port, it could be span port, or whatever the flavor is. So I pick a port or ports or grouping of ports, logical grouping, and I say I want everything on port one to come over to port two. Snap in my analyzer port two, and that's the copy traffic. All right? Simple. Snap in and go. Now there's some Tremendous pros and cons when it comes to span mirrors. And I want you to be aware of what these are so that if you choose to use this model, you at least know about them. Okay? So first of all, with a span mirror, let's just say that I took this server port and it's in out one gig. Let's just say it's a one gig attached server. And I take that, that port and I copy both directions of traffic because I want everything going to the server. I want to think everything coming from that server, and I want to copy it over my analyzer. So I take my analyzer, snap it into another port, which is likely 1 gig, unless we have a 10 gig port that's free that's sitting around that we could, uh, we, with also a 10 gig interface attached. Now how much potential do I have on that server port? I've got 1 gig going to it, potentially, and I have 1 gig coming from it. Potentially. One plus one is two. I've got two gigs of potential from that one physical port. However, the outbound to my analyzer is what? One gig. It's one. That's the first thing from a, if I use a span mirror, I want to think about. Now, I'm not in sales and I'm not a cat person, so just let's get that out there right away. However, these are things we want to think about. If I'm in a high throughput environment, I could have two gig potential. Go ahead, sir. Um, well, some switches, particularly the ones I have to do with, I have to turn off my flow stacks also to be able to monitor the tool. So the switch can keep up with the data stream for sure. You know, I come into environments, I like to mention this first because I come into environments a lot and my customers say, hey, Chris, you know, so we captured. And here's a, a three gig trace file on a USB drive. Here you go. 
and we captured it on our core server in our data center. We had 24 ports going to one. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> What's the first thing I think of with, with where does my brain immediately go? What did you miss? What was missed by the NLI? I got dirty data, potentially, or missing data. So if I'm looking for, if there's three million packets that were really the problem and I'm missing one, that could have been the one that hurt me. Or, as I'm going to get to when I get in, into a couple of the trace files, what that one missing packet will do to Wireshark is Wireshark's going to screen and throw a black line with red text. Have you seen that? And it's going to say, previous packet not captured. It's going to say, there's a few handful of things it's going to warn me of, which could completely direct my thinking. Is it legit packet loss? See, if it's packet loss, that's going to direct my brain into one domain of the problem. However, if I have missing data in a trace file, you know, there's, there's signatures that show you whether it's legit packet loss on the network, like if we see retransmissions or dupacks, things like that. However, it can be very difficult when we're getting started with trace files if we have missing data on them. So that's why I like to talk about this for a moment, because it's really, really, really easy to overrun the potential of a spam All right. If you have a whole switch out one ports one through twenty three and sending them over to port twenty four, think of the in out potential of all twenty three of those ports. Add it together and ask yourself: At any one time, will I exceed the outbound potential to my analyzer? And if you will, that's something you want to think about. Good. You really need all. all so how do the switches handle? They seem to go. They just drop. Whatever they can do, they go. They'll drop. Okay. Now most. So most switches are going to consider that to be a low priority thing, right? I want my switch to switch, and I want it to do all the cool little stuff that then it's doing. Span mirror, I don't necessarily need that to be a priority. It's different kind of exactly. So if, if I'm sending two gigs to a, a span mirror port, I'm going to get one gig out of that thing. That's all I'm going to get. The question is, what gig did I lose? And did my problem was it in that one? All right, so that's something I'd like you to think about. It's a common capture method. It's fantastic. It's free. You turn it on. It's in the middle of the day. There's not, no one's the wiser that you're capturing. So it's a great capture method. However, it's easy to overrun. Go ahead, you say one gig or two gig. What you really mean is one gigabyte per second? Mm -hmm. One gigabit per second. Talking about a rate. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. The speed, the uh, potential of that. When we talk bits or bytes, that's the common. When we're talking speed, we're talking bits. When we're talking amount of data, we mean bytes. Okay. If I have a gigabyte file, we're just saying gigabit. two gigs. You're really saying two gigabits per bits second. Per second. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's clear. So let's talk about some other ways we can capture. Anyone have any taps? Anybody? Yeah. Handful. So a tap is something that physically goes in line between two devices. Right, so now I have that server tapped. It's physical. I break at some point, one point or another, I break that connection. Now this could be on an uplink, it could be router to router, it could be uh, switch to server environment. So I'm in a virtual environment. So wherever those packets are physical, I can tap that. I have one physical cable going into that tap, one physical cable coming out, going to my switch, and then I take all of that traffic over to my analyzer and capture it. Now taps come in a lot of different shapes, sizes, flavors, potentials. You have aggregation taps going both directions. I could have, for this, it could be something called a breakout tap, where I have one direction of traffic going out one analyzer port, the other direction of traffic going out another analyzer port, meaning I need two interfaces on my capture device. So taps are a whole other thing. There's like five tap sponsors for SharkFest, so you can talk to them about their, you know, things and what they do. However, this is a it's a great way to capture traffic because I don't have the loss that I would experience with the uh, monitor port. Now it is possible I could overrun it. I need to make sure I'm getting the right kind of tap for the device I have. 
So there's a few things that I want to consider when it comes to taps. However, this is another way of getting in the path, getting the traffic that I'm interested in capturing. Now the pros and cons, I'm sure you can think about, oh, the pros are great, I get to capture all this traffic. One of the cons, they cost. I'm going to go buy it. I also have to physically put it in line at some point, downtime, even if it's a matter of seconds. So when, when you have a, the laptop, Good question. Do I need two ports on that laptop? <clears throat> Depends on the tap. If a tap is a breakout tap, where I have one direction out one port, another direction out another port, two outs, I need two ins to capture it. Otherwise, I'm getting one side or the other. I have gotten trace files before where someone's like, yeah, I capture you. I put the tap in there, and I you know, can't get in the analyzer port, hit start, and then I drop one direction. What usually happens in that case is they went on eBay, they saw a cheap tap and bought it, not realizing it's a breakout tap. Now, with Wireshark, you can have two interfaces capturing simultaneously. Huh? That's nice. Yeah. You can. You can, yeah. I could have a USB dongle NIC with my built in, and I could have two ends coming in, capturing at the same time. Now, for me, as an analyst, I don't like that because now I don't know what my capture potential is in my laptop. If any of you guys were here last year, I did a whole thing on how, how much traffic can my laptop handle if I blast that thing with a gig of traffic. And it's scary how little it can really do. Not just this one, anyways, because we shot out a lot of different vendors and, you know. Go ahead. Are you talking about the network capability or the data storage capability? I'm talking about the speed at which my laptop can swallow a gig. Like when I last year, one of the tests we did is we took a reliable one gig transmitter, sent it right to this box, and I hit capture with Wireshark. I only was able to keep up with about 80 meg. 8% of the data stream. 8. Ocho. <laughs> Not much. And so then I had people after my session coming up, I just got to stay dry on Apple. You know, you know <laughs> I can keep up with boop, boop, boop. All right, here's the feed. Took their feed, about 9%. I didn't see anybody's go over 10. And we shot a lot of laptops out. So right there, if I'm in a data center with a tap, with two outs from a tap, going to two ends on a laptop, Right there, there's all kinds of questions in my head. Do I have good data to then analyze? There's nothing more frustrating than opening up an already difficult trace file that I gotta figure out I got missing data for. And my brain has to fill in the gaps. That's definitely something that I spend time with with my customers. Well, you know, they'll tell me we've been spending weeks on finding this one packet, the trace file that Wireshark says is missing. Come to find out the whole time it was overrunning a buffer. It wasn't real. Uh, not in this one. Not in that. Well, yeah, this a little bit. We will. Um, okay, so a tap, this is another capture method, right? We can get in line with taps. Like I said, I'm going to let the vendors do their thing with taps. That's definitely not my, my bag, but this is a method. Uh, there's aggregation taps. Let's just say we're in a huge environment where we've got a bunch of servers, a bunch of things going on. We can take taps, we can tap all of these physical connections or even output from spans, take that to something called an aggregation tap. A bunch of ins go in and then we have one out coming to our analyzer. It can filter, it can slice and dice and make cocktails. I don't know. This thing, it does a lot of really fantastic filtering from the back end. So if you're in a huge environment and you need to bring in packets to one analyzer, you probably wouldn't have a laptop attached to this. You probably have some cool hotshot storage array that can do stream to disk at 100 gigs per second or something. But uh, that's another, another way. Now this is something that a lot of people do, especially when they're getting started, is they install Wireshark right there on the client. It is a way to get traffic. 
And we find a lot of times when people are just getting started with, with Wireshark. And honestly, I think there's nothing wrong, especially when you're getting started. It's all right. Wireshark, on client, start capture, break it, whatever happened, whatever application problem you're trying to fix, stop capture, and save. Now, you're going to get some people in this room that are going to go, that's unacceptable, you can't install Wireshark on the client because it affects the picture. Not, not so much that it's going to completely throw off your troubleshooting. Because how much traffic are we really talking about here? If this guy's going out and talking, doing some business intelligence, web-based application, salesforce.com, and he's going out and doing a few things that are breaking, and we just hit start and stop, how much traffic do you really think a client generates throughout the course of a day on average? Are we, are we shooting gig here? 100 meg? 10 meg? 5, 2. I benchmarked this thing at about, what, 400K? If they're streaming radio and listening to it, it's not a lot. They burst. They send file transfers, and they, you know, there might be a little burst when they get their email and things like that. But generally speaking, clients don't generate a ton on their end. So for two reasons, that's a great place to start. You don't have all this other junk to filter through. And two, it's likely that that device can keep up with running a little wire shark in the background and then allowing us to see the problem from the client perspective. So for me, when I'm out there troubleshooting, I try to start there. Go to, go to where it's broken and start there. You're not going to stay there. You're just going to start there. Because I want to know, is that client doing DNS calls? Is he doing DHCP stuff? Is he having a problem logging in or authenticating to a device? And then is he being sent to different servers to fully deliver that application to him? If I go server side, well, now I'm assuming that client is going to that server. What happens when you assume? <laughs> It bites you. And not only that, you're not only just dealing with him you're, or her, you're dealing with the other 100,000 connections that are coming into that server, and you're just hoping you can filter on the broken one. It gets messy. So let's just do ourselves a favor. When you're starting with Wireshark, start client in. See if you can capture it reliably. I'm not saying you're going to have a whole monitoring environment out there on the client side, but this is an intro class, right? We're just getting started with packets. Sir, you got a question? Yes, sir. Um, what if you can install, say, a little small switch in between the client and the main switch? Would be the same type of, you know, it would be small amounts of data? What word did he say that made my switch. little question go up? Switch. Mm -hmm. So you, well, you could have a device on that side. If it's one of those little mini switches, it still switches. Mm -hmm. So even if it's got four ports, even if it's your Linksys home networking device, it's still a switch. So otherwise, what do I got to find out of my cardboard box? Oh, oh, oh. They're getting harder and harder. And they're getting harder and harder to find. That's why I used to say hubs here. But they're hard to find. Jeff, go ahead. Well, in follow on comments, sometimes just unplugging to plug one of the little devices in because a theater drives a port, mic in, the yeah. switch will get applied. That may alone resolve the issue or change the issue. Yeah, you're you're now in, inducing a new device. So, or a lot of times, you know what I find too is now that guy's wireless. Now what? If I install Wireshark on his, you know, on that platform, then it'll find that wireless card and it'll capture off of it. And I kind of like that because now I don't have a lot of the other junk going on. However, if it's cabled in, um, and we do have a hub available, we can put that in there. However, I just do it on client, and I haven't seen a lot of negative. Yes, there are potential negatives. However, start there. Again, start client, and then if we need to, as soon as we know, there, as soon as our data steers us this way, then we go server side. Sorry, guys, I got to keep keep clipping along here. Now, problems aren't what they used to be. 
used to be simple client server model. We had one switch or simple network in the middle. We had this guy talking to that guy. We knew both points. There wasn't a lot of changing going on in the network environment. Now we see, I'm, I'm going to do a session later on this afternoon that shows how a lot of networking devices are getting in the way now. They're changing things they didn't used to change. It's not just natting. It's not just changing a port number anymore. Now, I'm going to show you an example this afternoon where it was changing specific stuff in the TCP headers. The network was. So we got a lot of complex environments today. However, as much as possible mentally, if you can, try to get your troubleshooting down to logically where you can you can get the problem to be like this, a simple, uh, just a simple scenario, all right? A client-server model. Uh, I know it's not like this still today. However, in your brain, if you can get it to be, just simplify it. This client's talking to that server. Start there, all right? And don't don't worry about your documents that show you have 500 front-end web servers. Just get down to where if you can get a single server, a single client. Now another thing that can happen with Wireshark, and I've seen this myself, is that you get a trace file, you got one terabyte captured, and now you have your boss and all the other silos within IT breathing over your shoulder saying, where's the problem? It's usually high pressure, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of different components that are involved with delivering an application. So not only do we have a complex issue, but now we have the, the time stress. Right? And I don't know about you, I wasn't very good at tests in school, so as soon as you put a, a trace file up there and the, the stress comes into it, it can be really easy to overlook simple things. So as much as it is possible, get the stress out of it. Take your time. I see this when I come in and watch other people when, when I'm helping them to resolve a problem that they've already captured. A lot of times they'll just jump over and think, oh, that's not involved, you know, okay, all right, here's my conversation. But wait, wait, back up, what is, what is that not involved stuff? What, what is that? Let's go over it and really think about what is each packet doing? And then we can get down to uh, the important things that are related. The, the whole idea here is to remove this feeling that we have. We look at a trace and this is how we feel. All right, so I'm going to show you a few examples uh, with some real trace files that we can just step through, show you a little bit about Wireshark setup to try to eliminate the feeling you get when you first open that trace file. All right, so let's go ahead and open up. I'm going to, if you did have access to the trace files that I gave you, uh, let's just start here. First thing I want to do is talk about just setting up your analyzer. Now, by default, if you just install Wireshark on a device, you're going to have a certain set of columns, all right? I'm sure up on top, you're, fam you're familiar with that being the summary view, all right? Each one of those lines up there represents one packet. We have the packet number. Now, on my Wireshark, I've configured an extra column here. Do you see we have our time column, the one right next to the packet number? That time column is something I can configure. I can configure it to be time since beginning of trace, or first packet. I can configure it to be time between packets, or delta time. Technically, end of one packet to end of one packet. Uh, we can have real time, the absolute time that this packet was captured. This packet was captured on April 22nd, 2011 at 10.39. I can, I can have that, oops, no, I don't want to change. So I can have just about anything I want from a time perspective in this column. So oftentimes that's one of the first things we want to think about. If we go to view, time display format, how do I want that time column to display? Do I want since the start, do I want since uh, epic time, that's since 1970. January 1st. Uh, however, I often leave that at packets, I'm sorry, seconds since beginning of capture. Why? I like to see, for me and my analysis style, I like to see jumps. At what point did this happen? Or while I'm capturing, 
Just as a tip for you, while I'm capturing and looking over someone's shoulder, if we start capture, I got a little eye on my watch. And I might even have a little notepad. Like, oh, they clicked that tab at five seconds, okay. They saw the screen populated at 20 seconds, okay. And then the error screen showed up at 30. Might write all that down, stop capture. See, now I can go with my running total of time, and I know that they didn't even do anything for the first 10 seconds. So why am I going to bother with the first 10 seconds of trades? I might dig through it and see, you know, all right, do I see a, a bad DNS resolution? Do I see something that's really glaring? However, the user didn't even begin to interact with the application until this, this point in time. So that's a helpful tip when we're trying to reduce the amount of extra stuff that we have to look through. You know, keep a stopwatch on it. Watch, this is when they logged in. This is when they started to interact with the application. This is when we saw the response. And now I have a point in time that I can reference in my trace form. That's an important set of notes, set of notes to have with you while you're capturing something. Wow. No, keep. Thank you. All right. So next to that, you're going to see a delta time column. All right, this one's huge. Absolutely something everyone should have in their profile, something to do with Wireshark. And that is time between. Time between display. Now, there's a handful of ways that you can add this column simply to Wireshark. The simplest one is you see in my frame details over here on the left, up on top, frame one, 71 bytes on wire, 506 bits, 71 bytes cat, all that stuff. That's extra stuff that Wireshark adds to this packet. It doesn't act physically at it, but it's information about that packet that I can use to troubleshoot. So if I expand that little plus up there, it's gonna show me a few different things that, about this packet. All right, for example, I can see all these time indexes if I want to generate a column for it. You notice a uh, time, time, time delta from previous displayed frame. This is the first packet in the trace file, so it's zero. If I take that one field, anything in brackets, any of this information, this is not real data that was captured off the wire. It's simply information about that packet that Wireshark is telling me to help me out. So I can come here, I can select that field, I can right click it, and then I can say add as column. It'll take that data for every single packet and put it up top and it'll allow me to rename that column. So now I have time delta from previous displayed frame for every packet right there in the summary. This is A1 first thing you should do when you open up Wireshark and make sure that you have this time. You have running total time and then you have delta time. Why? Because now we can start looking for delays. Probably one of the reasons why we're troubleshooting. Or we can look for breaks or things that aren't responding. Alright, so again, right click this guy, just add his column. Now the more complicated way to do this, if we come up to edit, and come down to preferences. This is where we can configure different uh, settings, different configuration parameters within Wireshark. I'm going to let some of the other people here at SharkFest really dig into the guts of this part of Wireshark. I'm going to keep this simple. If you come to columns, this is where you can simply add a column and fill in the, the, the value that you want that column to display. This is the manual way of doing it. The quick way is the one I just showed you. When you find a, a field that's interesting to you, right click it, add as column, it goes up above and it stays according to that profile. It's just a long way of doing it. All right, so let's say that we have, we've got our delta, we've got our source IP, destination IP, protocol, total length, info. All right, so now what? Now what do we do? We have our Wireshark configured to, with these different columns and now what do we do with all these packets? Well, we have some questions we need to answer first. Before you go lose yourself in the matrix, 
asked a few very key things. First of all, who was hurting? Who's the client? If we were capturing on the client, then we should know the answer to that. However, if we were capturing somewhere in the middle or even on the server end, who? Also, were they alone? Are they, only, are they the only person that was hurt by this issue? Or are they the only one that uh, was experiencing this problem? Uh, it also can be very helpful if we're looking at a trace file to have a working copy. Was there ever a time when it went away, when the problem wasn't there, to have a working baseline copy as well as the break? You can put one up on one screen and one up on another screen. Here's the working, here's the broken. Let's compare it line by line. It's very helpful to have. All right, so once we have a, a basic uh, understanding of who, see, now what we can do is start to add filters. All right, now filtering in Wireshark has to be one of the, I would say, it's not difficult, it's just remembering this thinking syntax. That's the problem. If we have an easy filter, something like a protocol, I'm sure we've all had to do this at this point with Wireshark, we can come up to that little filter bar up there and just type in the name of that protocol. IP, TCP, UDP, ARP, and the list goes on. However, when we have to start making things a bit more complex, we need to filter on a conversation, a TCP connection. Uh, we need to filter on an offset. That's where we start to get into some more complex filters. Uh, use Google. There's a lot of information out there if you have something really specific. However, try, try to get used to some very common ones. If I need to set a filter for a specific station, a specific IP address, if you just do IP dot, it's going to give you some help. Now what's nice about that little bar up there, you see how it turns red? That means I have a filter definition in there that makes no sense. IP dot doesn't help. It doesn't do anything. Not until that little bar turns green do I know that I got the right syntax for something. Now, if I just want to filter out a station, a single device, you see that little definition that came right under my little IP there? So IP adder. There's an IP address that I want to filter for. Now, keep in mind, if as soon as I say IP and I apply this display filter, it's going to display or show me all of the packets that match that condition. What's nice is that the other ones that didn't match, they're not gone. Right now, they're just masked. Right? So if I screw up my filter, I can remove it, change it, reapply it. So take, for example, uh, if I just want to filter on everything to and from this IP here, 10.0.0.1. If I come in here, ip.adder equals equals. And let's just type in that IP. You notice I got red, right? As soon as it goes green, now I have a filter that will actually be, I can apply to, to Wireshark. Hit enter, or I can come over here to hit apply. Totally depends on what I want to do. And there's my filter. Down here on the bottom, I can see this is the number of packets that's in my trace file. This is the number of packets that that filter was applied to, or how many packets were displayed by that filter. Right, so if you come in here, and if I put in an IP address of 10.0.0.5, and I see packets displayed zero. I got all my packets, packets displayed zero. That means that I set a filter for which there was no packet in the trace file. That's an easy thing to do. If I'm capturing server side and someone tells me, yeah, the client IP is 10.0.0.10, I set my filter and I don't see anything from 10.0.0.10. That means I was either in the right, wrong spot, I made a wrong assumption. His traffic really isn't coming to that server, it's coming to a different one. Right, so, so uh, that can be easy to do. We can also combine filters. Now there's several different uh, switches we could use, several different words you'll see that we can put into that little filter bar where it allows us to combine filters together. So this is where the syntax is from. Uh, we can use uh, words like or, and, not. 
So for example, if I want to say everything to and from 10001, and I want it to be TCP. So only TCP to and from that device. Literally, you can come in and put the word and. You can use symbols as well. I'll just try to keep it easy though. And, oops. All right, so what's this going to show me? Anything TCP to and from that IP. Now right here, what do you see up there? So what's going to happen to all this background? Will it show me? Why not? Probably not. It's probably not uh, TCP DNS, likely. Let's try. If I say apply. Oh, it all went away. All right, I'm still OK. I've still got all my packets, but I've just displayed none. Why? I was too specific with my filter. Or I put a filter and it didn't make any sense. Or the filter itself, just there was no packets that had that condition, right? So we can also combine these. We can put several different IP addresses. We can take all kinds of different combinations depending on what we're interested in filtering for. So getting going with Wireshark, this is something you want to get comfortable with. Uh, try to do this weekly, if not daily. Add an IP filter. Remove it. Play with that syntax. Uh, the more you do it, the more you're going to remember the, this syntax as it uh, um, and get comfortable with it. So you have a question? Is there like a little manual for the syntax? Because I tried looking for it and couldn't find it. That's an excellent question. So we all have our, our favorites, I'm sure. Um, there's a few different, uh, like ask.wireshark, there's quite a list. Ask.wireshark.org, there's a good list of display filters. Uh, for me, I just have an a article on Love My Tool. It's top 10 Wireshark filters. It's just the biggies. And if you Google Wireshark filters, you'll find it. Oh. And it's just a quick, a total, you know, just the 10 most common ones that I've seen uh, people use. But these are just examples. Of it, right? Exactly. These are examples. Tell you the exact syntax in some kind of yeah. I mean, precise form. The the helps out there. Um, there's a few little forums that are specific Wireshark filters, creating Wireshark filters on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll uh, if I forget the syntax, I'll you can use the expression view, or I'll type out what I remember. You know, if, I, if I'm looking for something like TCP, what was that TCP dot uh, analysis, what was that? And then if you just pause there, then it'll help you and say, do you mean this? Do you mean that? And help you get down to the syntax. Or another thing you can do, this is not cheating. This is what, what uh, it's a much easier way to build a filter. If you're looking at something specific that you want to filter on, you can just use the analyzer interface to do it. For example, uh, if I come down here and I see, uh, let's just pick something, everything with a time to live of 128. Let's just say I wanted to filter on that. I can just right click and it's going to give me a bunch of options. Do I want to right now add a filter or create a display filter based on whatever it is I clicked on? Do I want to, you see where it says uh, apply this filter? That's where I can come in and say, I want to apply that, that value at that location of, of uh, an IP packet. I want this value at this offset, or whatever field it is that I clicked on. So apply this filter selected or not selected. Not selected means I want to show everything that doesn't have this value right here. Um, what I'll do a lot is I'll just say prepare a filter selected, and then the syntax will appear up there. Then I can modify it if I want to. That's, that's a nice little trick to use. So again, remember you're right clicking. Um, remember you can filter on a conversation quickly. You can filter on a TCP port number. In fact, a lot of people, you'll watch them. If you look at the, over at the reef and watch people drive through, through uh, uh, Wireshark filters, a lot of times they don't do a lot of typing up, upstairs in that little address bar anymore. Now they just right click and add, and, or they'll save. You can also save filters. If you have one that you use a lot, or a certain server or application or port number, you can define that, save it, and name it 
whatever it is you want. In fact, I think I have, I'll show you one that I have. If you want, I can send you this filter. You see Facebook servers? Over there, up on the top. So I have uh, a definition. You see that monster? Uh, it's basically any any server IP or any IP that matches one of those different subnets up there, which I got from Facebook. So if any packet matches any of those definitions, it's a Facebook conversation. So I can come up and if I'm doing analysis for someone, they just want to say, uh, show me everybody who's using Facebook all day in my company, so I can have a talk with them. So we'll grab grab some of the traffic. I can just come up and I click that button and boom. I've got all the IPs of people that are having those conversations. Now in all fairness, now there's a lot of Facebook plugins to just common web servers. So even if I go out to CNN, a lot of times that server will have me head check or Facebook for something. So right then it comes down to how much what the whole conversations are they having. Are they having you know, all right, so I've got to move on. Okay. Any questions on filters? Yeah, go ahead. So, it's not related to the uh, this is a nice fine call of that. Well, for example, you selected the same level and other. The moment you take the focus out of it and click on something else, how, I, I always forget what is the frame I am looking at. So, is there any way we can fix the color for it? Like frame 11, I want to make sure that. Oh, I yeah. For example, I'm looking at frame. Uh, now it is showing the frame 3 here, right? Mm -hmm. In the window here. That means I was looking at frame 3. Uh -huh. So that's the way I take the focus out of it. I mean, I, I lose control there. I, I don't know what was the frame I was looking before. Okay. Before I take the focus out of it. Have you ever used bookmarks? Yeah. I, yeah. You how can do you do that? Uh, right click bookmark. It's um, if you come up to three, this is where we could set. Where to do? Where is my bookmark? Where to go? Uh, anyone remember? Like if I have a bookmark, is a it's a setting you can set on one packet, and I could say, hey, go pull up all the bookmarks on a trace file. I just can't remember the, where the tool is. But you could do that. You could, um, if you want to make sure that packet three is something that's always visible to you, you could double click it and a separate window appears with packet three. And then you can keep your, your analysis going. Um, you could create a whole separate trace file with just that one packet with whatever conversations you want to continually have and save that off. Sometimes when I'm doing an analysis, I'll have three different uh, windows with the same trace file because I want to see different things and, and just be able to look over at it while continuing to work on a trace. Uh, does that answer your question though? Yeah. Well, there's another option in the right part. You can mark your packet. Uh-huh. So what is that mark by it? Does it mark it? Why do you do that? Uh, you can filter on marks. So you could mark it, uh, this one's pertinent, this one's pertinent, this one's pertinent, and just, just display those. Um, you know, I don't use marks a lot. If anyone does, then you can share your wisdom. Go ahead. So how does the marking differ from a reference file? Is it the same thing? I don't know. I don't use marks a lot. Um, several of those, uh, like destination uh, or source addresses, have uh, instead of the whole IP address, it has like Cisco dash. And how does that happen? So this is from um, the source and destination address bar. It's going to show you the highest layer of address that it has. So if you notice the protocol, what's the protocol for that packet and for? Let me switch. ARP. So does ARP have an IP address? The way that an IP address would be displayed, does ARP have IP? It's kind of a between layer 2, layer 3 function. 
I have an IP and I need the MAC address for it. But in the ARP header itself, there is no IP header. See this? It's just an ARP header. So the best that I'm going to do for this non-IP protocol is show the MAC addresses. Or if I have an IPX protocol or something non-IP, then I'll show those addresses. IPv6, I'll show those addresses instead of IP. You're only going to see an IP address if you're working with that header. If you have an IP address to this one. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I was also thinking that perhaps there's a way to take an IP address and assign a uh, name to it. Yes, you can do that. Um, that's a part of the, the next generation standard for uh, the PCAP MD definition. You can assign a name, but I've, I've never done it. So, But someone here has, so you can for sure. Actually, I was just talking to uh, um, Kevin Burns, he's going to be speaking out there soon. He says he does that all the time. He said it, for him, he'd rather see, you know, good server, bad server, or Chris PC, or something like that, rather than an IP address. So, at least I'm going to come up right off the top a little bit how to do that. Okay, so again, making sense of the matrix. Let's take a look at a few examples of of good problems, good bad problems. Um, something I definitely want to show you. I like this one because it uh, it involved a really slow application, and why we were hitting our heads on it for well the the client I was working with was for sure. Now what this is is we're going out to an application, we're just hitting a page, and we saw a little spinning wheel. We were waiting, 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 waiting for a long amount of time. And then all of a sudden, the page popped. Now, the person that was doing the driving often gave up patience and then just let go of the application, just shut the browser, or he started it back up again, rather than patiently waiting for the application to respond. However, uh, there's a lot we can learn from this, especially uh, as an introductory trace file, getting us all warmed up. First of all, up above, we do see that the client connects with the server, right? You see a TCP SIN go, that's the first packet of the TCP handshake. If you want to really dig into the guts of the TCP handshake, Betty the Boy, she's got an awesome session for you coming up in a couple days. The anatomy of the TCP handshake, make sure you go to that, especially if you need a Wireshark. It's an awesome session. So client sends a SIN to server, we know it's a SIN. Look over there at the, the uh, summary view, right? So it's a SIN, it's a TCP synchronization packet. Server responds. Now, because we have our delta time column up here, how long did it take that server to respond? 97 milliseconds. Now, if we're not familiar, familiar how to read that delta time, just so you know, the full number here is seconds, dot, and we have milliseconds as the first three, and then microseconds is the second set of three. Okay, and you're going to get familiar with that, familiar with reading that as you uh, continue to use Wireshark. So, for example, on the bottom, frame 18, that's just 52 milliseconds, 1 millisecond, 8 milliseconds, right? So, 97 milliseconds. Now, first of all, that tells me a lot about uh, what was happening initially. Did my sin get there? Well, I got a sin that. That means it got there. And I can also set a little benchmark network round trip time. That 97 milliseconds represents my initial network round trip time between client and server. We were capturing client side. 97, great. Now, here's a question for you. Is that good? Depends. What? How far away is it? Location. How far away is it? What's normal? Well, right now, I don't know. So you're gonna get the you're gonna get that question a lot when you're looking through traces. Is that good? Well, I need a baseline. I need a baseline. Is that normal? Is that something that uh, healthy normal operation experiences as well as bad? So right now I don't have a basis of saying whether that's good or bad. Now I do know what was the symptom that I told you? The guy was staring at his spinning wheel. He gave up his patience. Would 97 milliseconds make someone do that? No. Not yet. <laughs> He's not punching his screen yet. 
right? We all agree? Seconds, if it was 97 seconds, it would be a different story. You can punch that screen. But 97 milliseconds, I mean, come on. That was more than 97 milliseconds. All right. Client response, six milliseconds later, we have a successful three-way handshake. We are connected. That's what TCP does. It establishes a connection. Now it's got a channel to use. Then the applications, the gets, the, the calls, the application uh, itself begins to take over. So now if we come down to packet number four, is this client to server or server to client? What direction is packet four? Client. Client server. It's client server. And how is that a big packet, a small packet? What is that? It's a mega packet. That's big. We look at the length. 1,500. Is, is that good? 1,500? What, what does that mean? It's a full packet size. How big can a packet be? You're right. It just depends. Is it a jumbo frame? Is it like, where am I capturing this thing? However, generally speaking, if I'm capturing off the wires, I'm getting in the path of packets, and I'm in an Ethernet condition, the Ethernet frame, unless I'm on a trunk or a basic port, I'm going to have 1518 as my upper limit. For most, I know there's exceptions. I know there's, you know, the VI frame tagging and all that stuff. However, generally speaking, that's a full size frame. All right, so what's the frame beneath it? Client server or server to client? Client to server, how big is it? So did this thing send two gets? Did it send two requests to the server? Like what? How should I read packet five? Is that normal, healthy, not worried yet? The client is just sending a request to the server. That this is actually the uh, packet five is where initially they got stuck. Even though they see the black, the red, and just this looks bad, right? I mean, the, the four lines of black. However, that two packet call, it just means that the call was so big, the request was so big, it spanned two packets. That's okay. There's probably a cookie in there, there's probably some type of client info in there, right? It just means that the client had more to send to the server or request from that server than he could fit in a single packet, that's all. At this point, again, what was my complaint? Waiting on Spinning wheel. Am I waiting on a spinning wheel yet? How much time am I, have I has elapsed by the time I hit packet five? 104 milliseconds. Is he punching the screen yet? No, I agree. Packet six is a what? So response from the server saying I received the request. Is there any data in that packet? 40. No. You see a little in the summary view. You got a you got a TCP hack. If we want to get really detailed in the TCP over there with the sequence and acknowledgement numbers, we can get in there and take a look at the actual 1496 that was acknowledged from the previous packets. This is just an hack. That means my request got there. How long did it take to receive the app? I don't know, six 106 milliseconds. Am I worried? Is that bad? If you take a look at the handshake like you would a baseline, 97 milliseconds was my initial network not trip time. The sending a request to the server and getting an acknowledgement to that data was milliseconds more. Is the guy punching his screen yet? No. So far, we're OK. Now the fun comes. <laughs> packet seven. What on earth is that? First of all, he's punching the screen right now. <laughs> Forty-five seconds later. Yeah, and then it goes to ninety after a time. Is there data in packet seven? Is that a response? Who sent you? Client. 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 Where, to where's my stuff? 
TCP saying, are we still talking? Hello? Right? Should I shut this connection down? Because I do have other stuff that could use this connection. So are we just going to keep waiting here in a standoff? It's a TCP keep alive. It's keeping the connection alive. Now, is TCP doing anything wrong? Is there a network problem? Do we have retransmissions? But you have a lambda data. What what are we waiting on right now? Server contact to respond. Is the network slow? No. What were my two round trip times so far for, in terms of network response time? 97 and 106. Is that okay? Yeah. It's certainly better than 45 seconds. <laughs> so the lion's share of my time is sitting server side right now at this point, and the guy's punching his screen. <laughs> so why are the flag under the bad TCP? Like that's a good question. Uh, that's a more of a developer type of thing. Um, it's a flag for, hey, this connection is taking so long that now we actually have to keep it alive. Um, some people feel that it shouldn't be left. Some people feel that it should. I'm the, the, the not the former. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's because a lot of times that's where your attention is going to go, right? Oh, left bed, boom. What's going on? But if we take, do you see the process we're going through right now? This is exactly what you need to do with the trace bar. Pack it by packet. What is it doing? Is this okay? And how does this match what the symptom is of my troubleshooting exercise in the first place? The problem was time. This connection established, things look good. However, we're sitting here waiting 45 seconds. <clears throat> what happens? The server comes back. Frame eight, how long did it take the server to respond? Again, 90-something milliseconds. 99 milliseconds, is that that? Services, yeah, keep us alive. I'm still working. The TCP socket on the other side is still open. We're still working, don't shut. How about packet 9? What happened again? We waited so long that so here again, we are at keeping this TCP connection on. So at this point, how far are we into the trace file on packet 9? There's our spinning wheel. There's our guy punching the screen. So frame 10, server comes back. Yep, we're still talking. <laughs> we're thinking, OK. Well, I've now twice almost timed out my TCP connection. Well, I've kept it alive. I've had to do it with this function. All right, finally, packet 11. What is this? What direction? Server to client. Server to client. Is there data? Yes. Now it's actually started. So after packet 11, what are my delta times like? What are my. Uh, does it seem like things are lagging after packet 11? Once I start to hear that response, things come screaming in. And actually, if we look at the rest of this trace file, it's only 84 packets, but the whole thing finishes at about 110 seconds. Now, out of that 110 seconds, full seconds, how much of that time did I spend just waiting? 108. About 108. So 110 and 108 of it was sitting there waiting. For who? Waiting for what? For the server to compile the data. Now, here's, the, here's what I don't know. You're, you guys are spot on. It's not network. The thing I don't know from this vantage point is what was that server doing for 108 seconds? I can't answer that from this specific vantage point. I was capturing the client side. So what's my next troubleshooting step? Go to the other server side. Okay, let's go server side. Now let's span, tap, capture server side, watch requests come in. Now what do I want to do? I see requests come in from client. I receive response from server. Now I have request response. Same stuff, but now we're on the other side. Now what do I want to do in that span of time? What else is going on? Is that server in the middle of a backup? 
Is it going to the back end and saying, hey, Chris wants his stuff. Hey, SQL, Chris wants his stuff. Oracle, what's going on? Are you there, Oracle? Okay, no, you're listening. You're not listening. What if this guy is just the middleman? So we don't want to shoot him yet. <laughs> but we don't have enough from the client side to empirically say what component of the application is taking up that other date. However, we just exonerated client, network. Is there any packet loss here? Okay, things are looking good. So that exercise that we just stepped through taking it a packet at a time and thinking about what does that packet do? What does it tell me? This is going to help you make sense of the matrix. Right? And then really giving yourself that context. Write it on a board if you have to. What was the problem they were complaining about? In this case it was time, spinny wheel. Let's go find that time. Let's find out where that time is being spent. Do your best when you're looking at a trace file to put those black lines in their context. Now, gentlemen over here brought up a good question about the TCP keep a lot. Should those be black? Kind of a some some people will tell you yes and some will tell you no. If you don't like that, you can always remove the colors. <laughs> Which in fact sometimes that's what I'll do. If I have too much of the black lines and it's getting in my way, in a way. I'll just remove them. And now you can just read what it's telling you. You don't have to get mis misled by anything. All right, uh, I'm almost toward the end of my, my time here. So the purpose of this was to warm you up. It was to get you started and thinking about what columns are helpful to you. Uh, also, we were talking about the types of filters that you might be setting. Hopefully, you saw a bit of a process as far as after you, once you capture and actually have the traffic, now how do we begin to step through that traffic one packet at a time? Now unless you are sure of what that packet is, don't move on. Someone standing next to you might say, oh that's not related, just keep going. You know, people tell me that all the time. And I'm sitting there with a trace file just like this one and they'll say, no that's not related, I know what that is. Wait, what is it? Does it have anything to do with the application? Until you know, don't move on. Take the time. Even if it takes you a week to analyze a, a 100 packet trace block, learn it. Because the next time you go back to that same 100 packets, it's going to take you a day, then an hour, then five minutes, then you'll be whipping through these trace files quick. But take that time first. We are, fundamentally, we're learning a language, right? It's just the language that these applications and these, these machines speak. Okay, so I'm going to be up here. I'll answer any questions you have if I can, but thanks for coming to this. Enjoy Shark Fest. Go enjoy some of those other sessions, but uh, we can go ahead and break for our lunch. So thanks for coming, everybody.